This is the 10% Happier Podcast. I'm Dan Harris. Hey, gang. Greetings. I have this vivid memory of being on a beach vacation with a bunch of friends many years ago when I was first getting interested in meditation. I was lounging and reading a book about Buddhism. And one of my friends spotted me reading this book and remarked that he could personally never do Buddhism or meditation because he was a comedy writer and he needed to retain his capacity to be judgmental. There is so much to unpack in that comment. I mean, I wish that meditation uprooted my capacity to be judgmental. I wish that the technology were so effective. But anyway, I think the real misunderstanding here is that there's somehow a lot of value to being judgmental. I think that misunderstanding is based in a conflation of discernment with judgmentalism. If anything, I think mindfulness, clear seeing, self-awareness, the kind of skills you generate through meditation, will make you better able to discern the kind of details that might make good comedy or help you make better decisions generally. And one of the things that being mindful teaches you is that being judgmental kind of sucks. It's painful. Judgmentalism carries a valence of ill will or hatred or superiority, none of which feel good if you're actually paying attention. And of course, many, if not most of us, expend most of our judgmental energy, not on other people, but on ourselves, nitpicking every decision, second guessing compulsively. As a friend of mine once joked, if anybody else said to him the kinds of things that his inner narrator says to him, he would punch that other person in the face. And yet many of us truly and deeply believe that we need to liberally apply the inner cattle prod in order to get anything done. I will admit that I'm still working on this for myself. So today we're going to talk about how to work with the judging mind. My guest is La Sarmiento, who's been practicing Vipassana meditation since 1998. La is a mentor for the Mindfulness Meditation Teacher Certification Program a teacher with Cloud Sangha, and a contributor to the 10% Happier app. In this conversation, we talk about how mindfulness can help us identify when we're being judgmental, discernment versus judgmentalism, how it can be so delicious to be judgmental of other people, but why it's actually harmful to ourselves and others, the four questions to ask when we notice ourselves going into judgment mode, operationalizing the phrase, am I suffering right now? as a life hack par excellence, investigating the motivations behind our striving for success, and why owning up to it when we've been a jerk is sometimes the exact right answer. We'll get started with La Sarmiento right after this. La Sarmiento, how we doing? Doing well, thank you, Dan. Good to be here again. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks for doing it. So, judgment, being judgmental, this is a problem for other people because I've never had this problem, but you've in the past publicly told a quite moving story. I'm wondering whether you'd be willing to tell it here about your history with this particular quality of mind, which is, of course, universal, which, if memory serves, you really first encountered in your childhood. Yeah, thank you, Dan. So as a very young child, when I was about five years old, I, I recognized or realized that I was queer, I was non-binary, and of course didn't have any vocabulary for that at that age in 1969. So basically, I felt there was just something innately wrong with me. And so the concept of judgment came up from this fear of being less than other people and doubtful and insecure of myself. So being judgmental of others was really a way for me to feel better about myself. And so it really kind of stemmed from this place of deep insecurity, doubt, lack of belonging, acceptance in a world that I intuited at a very young age didn't accept someone like me. What form did this judgmentalism take? How did it express it, it, itself? 
Yeah. So it could express itself like being competitive. I would compare myself to others and try to beat people out, whether it be academically or athletically, just trying to be better than everybody else is how it showed up for me. And thinking that people that didn't meet the standard that I had set for myself were less than adequate or less than who I was at the time. And it created a lot of a sense of superiority, a false sense of superiority, I would say, and to a certain extent, a, a way of further isolating myself. And that's something that I later in life recognized was that that was happening, was I wasn't creating more connection. I was actually creating separation by comparing myself and judging others for being less than who I had myself be in the world. Just to say, I think it's really useful to talk about this, and I appreciate your candor. So you talked about it in a childhood context. Did it play out through your adult years as well? Yeah, I would definitely say it played out a lot in my relationships. And it became actually more internalized. Like I started judging myself more in this comparison to others. And so I furthered the story that I was less than others. Like, for example, when I started teaching the Dharma and mindfulness, I would compare myself with my colleagues thinking that, oh, I went on way less retreats than they did. I'm not like a very naturally inclined sitting meditation person. I try to integrate mindfulness and and the Dharma into my everyday life. And so going on long retreats wasn't something that interested me at all. And so when I was dubbed a teacher, I began to like doubt, like, oh, am I actually really qualified for this? And why are people inviting me to to teach when I, I definitely don't have the same credentials or qualifications as many of my colleagues? And I even put the story on, well, how many immigrant non-binary people of color are there in the Dharma when I was there? And I was just there to like check off a bunch of diversity boxes. I mean, that's how kind of low I got with myself. And so I would judge people that believe different political beliefs as I did, who weren't spiritual like I was, all in the name of trying to feel some sense of superiority or some sense of, yeah, like I was someone and not nothing. You mentioned the fact that you come from an immigrant family. I believe you've also talked about this kind of, it's my term, not yours, and maybe it's going to work, maybe it won't, but this kind of compensatory judgmentalism that your parents adopted as well upon arrival in this strange new country. Yeah, exactly. And it was really interesting because as people of color immigrated from the Philippines, they became actually more judgmental of other people of color than the dominant culture. And so we were taught to, if we were going to survive in this country, it really was about assimilating into the dominant culture versus being proud of the where we came from, our own heritage. And so that was another mixed message I got, that I wasn't acceptable or good enough or okay in this country. And so I feel in a lot of ways, my parents' judgment of others also stemmed from feeling inferior and coping mechanism to feel more superior within themselves. Now that you're a grown up and you have, at least in my mind, unimpeachable bona fides as a meditation teacher, do you still notice judgment coming up in your mind directed at other people or yourself? I definitely notice when it arises. Like even this morning, I I woke up and I was feeling really anxious. And I'm usually like pretty easygoing and and peaceful. And I'm like, why am I feeling anxious? Then I thought to myself, oh, because I'm going to be on this podcast with Dan this afternoon. And like, who am I to be on this podcast with someone like you and in a podcast like this? And I just recognized like, oh, yeah, that's my like younger self, my inner five-year-old who got a needs improvement and show and tell, really not wanting to like show up and be in front of however many people will be listening to this. What if I mess up? What if I don't say the right things? All these things started coming up and I just had to pause and just use the practice in this way of like, oh yeah, buddy, you're struggling right now. Like you're scared, you're insecure, you're doubtful. And just really acknowledging like that was what was happening and just taking some breaths and reminding myself that I've been on this podcast with you before. I will do the best I can. And if that's not good enough, I'm just happy I showed up. (laughs) (laughs) For the record, I have no doubts about whether you deserve to be here. (laughs) So just to say that, and if you mess up, we'll edit it out. (laughs) But I want to put a pin on something you did 
with yourself or to yourself in that moment of anxiety, which is you very specifically talked to yourself. You use the word buddy. We've done episodes on on this, and I find this to be incredibly compelling. The, the idea that we can counter-program against these ancient neurotic programs we've got by very deliberately talking to ourselves. Uh, I'll just shout out Ethan Cross, who's been on the show before. He's done quite a bit of research. We'll put a link to his episode in the show notes. He wrote a book called Chatter, and he's done a lot of re- research in, at the University of Michigan and into our capacity, our now proven capacity, to talk ourselves down from whatever ledge we've talked ourselves up onto. So can you say more about how you operationalize this insight? Yeah, thank you, Dan. So for me, it's usually the part of me that gets scared or stressed out or feels doubtful or insecure. It's actually a younger version of myself that got the needs improvement in show and tell that had that story haunt me for most of my life that really has hindered me, but at the same time has been this blessing in a way to face into, like, this is not who I am. This is the story that I've carried ever since I was a little kid who didn't know how to deal with this. And so now, through the practice of mindfulness, I've been able to, oh, recognize, like, it's okay to have these feelings. And really being kinder and gentler with myself around my perfectionism, which was one of my other survival mechanisms, to not let anybody see that I was flawed or insecure or doubtful or fearful of things. And so I think that's what has really helped me in my teaching is that I'm just very honest about what's going on for me. So it really is about humanizing our experience. And so if someone who is labeled a teacher or a leader can own like, oh yeah, I I do feel scared or I do feel insecure, then it hopefully makes everyone else feel like, oh, well, maybe it's okay to feel those things. We all have sort of this tendency in this culture to hide behind some facade that's not really who we are. And I just basically got tired. It takes a lot of effort to keep trying to present in a way that's inauthentic. Yes, you're doing the opposite of the curated Instagram feed. And I think it's extremely healthy. I've heard this term. I don't know who came up with it. Cathartic normalization. (laughs) Now, it's possible, as Brene Brown, the great sociologist, and researcher has pointed out to overdo that, but you're not. And it's very helpful to talk about what's happening in the mind. And then, of course, what you add is is how to deal with it. You talked about mindfulness there, but one of the old cliches about Buddhism is that there are two wings of the Dharma. There's wisdom, which you can define as seeing clearly, and compassion. And in your morning routine, talking yourself off of the ledge of anxiety this morning, I heard both wings. You had to have the mindfulness, the seeing clearly, the wisdom to notice that this was happening, that you were having this inner dialogue, and then the compassion or warmth or friendliness, you might even say love, to give a shit and try to give yourself some first aid. Right. Exactly. And, you know, it's been this process of kind of reparenting myself because, you know, as much as my dear parents tried to raise us well, everything was about hiding all those aspects of myself, like just suck it up and just keep moving on. You know, we're immigrants. We can't like dwell on our feelings or disagreeing with something. We just have to keep moving forward. And so for me, it, it really was a way of accepting like this is who I am. And these are feelings that are very human that I'm, as an adult, like really allowing myself to feel and allowing myself to take care of those feelings and not putting that on anybody else, whether it be my parents, my partner, my friends, that it's my responsibility to to take care of them in that way. And so sort of the litmus test for me is always noticing when I'm suffering. One of my dear teachers, Eric Holvig, said at the end of one of the retreats, and this stuck with me for probably 20 years now, if there's anything you're going to take from this retreat, let it be these two things, to practice every day and to notice when you're suffering. And when I can notice at any point in time during the day when I'm suffering, whether it be physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, then I, I tell myself to just slow down, slow down, take some breaths, acknowledge, honor, nurture, whatever is going on for you, and it'll be okay. The more I push it away or try to suppress it, it just keeps coming back at me. 
So if I can process these emotions and feelings as they come up, then I'm not harboring a lot of that stuff in me all the time, which I think many of us in this culture do. And then we explode or we make unskillful choices or decisions or actions or speech because we're just constantly in reaction to whatever is right in front of us. I've said this before, but your story about what was said to you at the end of the retreat reminds me of this mini realization I had when I was on a retreat once, which is that if I'm suffering, there's something I'm not mindful of. Yeah, exactly. And in noticing that suffering, then we become more mindful. And there's something we can actually do about it if we choose to, if we remember to. And that's the the other part is remembering that we have a choice in how we proceed once we get that we're suffering. Sometimes I'll be suffering and then I'll just like sling another arrow or two in there or three or four. And it's like, wow, I'm really shooting myself up here. And so I think as I get older, as I get more mindful, I'm much more sensitive to the fact like, yeah, I don't want to suffer. Like I'm totally open to experiencing pain in this life. It's just a a given, but I don't have to add to that pain by the stories I tell myself or internalizing stories society says about someone like me or what somebody else may be projecting on who I am. Yeah. So it's more of this discernment. And I think the more I discern, the less I judge. You've said that when you notice judgment in your mind, there are four questions you ask yourself. Can you run through those? Yeah. So usually, is my heart open or closed? Am I suffering or am I free? Am I feeling empowered or disempowered? And am I feeling connected or disconnected? Why those questions? I think for me, they in particular just kind of go to the root of it. Because if we're feeling disconnected, our hearts shut down, I'm not feeling empowered. And if I'm suffering, that it, it's painful. Like it's physically painful. It's emotionally draining. It's mentally exhaustive. And then especially around feeling disempowered. It's like, oh, I've given away my power again. Oh, I've appeased or I've allowed someone to like step all over me again. And it's something, it just helps me remember like, What's most important to me, and that's to keep an open heart, to not suffer, to be free, and to feel empowered. And so it really is this way of just checking myself. Like, where am I right now in this moment around those four particular aspects? Open heart is a term that gets thrown out a lot, but I think maybe for some of us, it can be hard to access through all the cultural baggage. So very specifically, what do you mean by it? Yeah. So, you know, our culture tends to be like your either heart is like wide open or closed. So it's like this off and on switch. And my dear teacher, Joe Weston, often talks about what if we upgrade to a dimmer switch? So rather than it be totally open 100% or totally closed 100%, depending on the situation, we use our dimmer switch to be like, oh, when I listen to the news, my heart is about 20% open. But when I'm playing with my dogs, it's like 95% open. And so there's this continuum of open heartedness so that it's not making oneself totally vulnerable. And at the same time, it's not totally shutting ourselves off from life altogether. But it's like, depending on the situation, how do I discern how open I feel is safe enough for my heart to be in this situation or with this person? And again, very specifically, when you say your heart is open or closed, what does that actually mean? It's just your openness to the information, your openness to processing other people's emotions. What do you mean specifically? I would say it's like my capacity to be willing to engage, to be willing to cultivate patience and understanding and respect and love and compassion. So it's having that capacity to to be present with life, no matter how it's unfolding, whether it's something joyful or something that's really challenging and, and painful, but to be there with it is what I mean by my heart being open. It's kind of the opposite of being judgmental. Yeah, exactly. Judgment creates separation, creates pain. It creates a sense of of isolation, not belonging. And it's all the ways that we as humans are 
not wired to be. We are wired to to actually be social on a continuum as well. And so we're all different and what that means for us can vary. And to me, like judgment, I think has gotten a really negative connotation around it. And so for me, I tend to use the word discernment because it's not like shooting from the hip. It's more thoughtful. It's like, okay, let me just pause for a moment and see what's all here and take it in and from my own sense of integrity and discernment, figure out like what, what's the best thing. And I don't do that all the time. You can ask my partner. Like last week, she said, you know, you're being a jerk right now. It's like, yes, I'm very mindful that I'm being a jerk right now. And I'm very aware that it feels really good to be <laughs> a jerk in this moment. And eventually I'll, be, I'll apologize to you for the impact that's having, but that's what's present for me right now. So yeah, so I'm not always open hearted. Sometimes I, I lose it and, and can go into my old habit energies as well. You talked about the difference between being judgmental and being discerning. And I think some people will have the thought in their head, well, shouldn't I be judgmental sometimes? I mean, if I lose my capacity to be judgmental, I'm not going to be able to tell who's right and wrong or make a diff- the choice between chocolate and vanilla at the, at the ice cream store, whatever. So how do you respond when you get that question? Yeah. So when I hear the word judgmental, I automatically go to this place of like, okay, there's this judging aspect that's not necessarily informed in a way. It's more of like a gut reaction to something. And so there's just something about the word judgmental that just doesn't sit with me well. And so I use discerning instead because it, for me, it just kind of slows down the process and has me kind of take inventory of all that's present and that's happening, and then choosing to act or speak from that place. It's like, oh, because people will say like, oh, you're being judgmental. (laughs) Automatically, you get defensive. It's like, I know I'm not. But if we discern, for me, that's more of like, I'm speaking from my own experience. I'm speaking from my own discernment of what's happening. And this is mine. It's not a projection of judgment onto something else. Well, we're very good at self-deception, though. So, I mean, I can imagine telling myself a whole story about how, no, 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 in this moment, I'm being discerning, not judgmental, when in fact, I (laughs) am being judgmental. (laughs) That's why we practice mindfulness, Dan. (laughs) It's because we're aware. It's like, I'm trying to pull the wool over my own eyes or somebody else's eyes. The other skeptical question I, I could imagine arising in the minds of listeners on this topic would be something along the lines of, isn't there some deliciousness to being judgmental at times? Isn't that the basis of comedy? Isn't gossip fun? I'm having trouble formulating the question exactly, but do you you understand what I'm pointing at? Yeah. So I think it's really around context. And there's a lot in comedy that folks get away with that you wouldn't necessarily get, get away with in a everyday conversation, per se. When I first watched this one comedian, Russell Peters, and he was making fun of all different kinds of mostly Asian accents and stuff, it was like, I noticed myself like, oh, I'm like, laughing at that because in certain ways, especially when he did accents from the Philippines, it was like, oh yeah, that definitely sounds like my parents. But I've seen Dharma teachers do this where they will imitate their like say Indian guru and that's just not cool. So it, it to me, it like really depends on the context of, of which we're doing this. And there are definitely comedians that get called on some of their comedy, like Dave Chappelle and etc. So it really is a lot, fine line depending on who's receiving the entertainment and whether they think it's appropriate or or not. How can I judge that for anybody but myself? Where do you stand on a good gossip sesh? There's definitely a little, especially like if it's somebody that I'm not very fond of or I don't respect, et cetera. And then I'll, I'll feel into that a little bit. And then I'll, I'll pause and remember, like, would I want anyone else to be talking about me this way? And it usually is. I'll get into a conversation with someone and we'll go off on somebody. And, and, then, and then I notice, like, oh, it just doesn't feel good. It doesn't land well in my heart. My body starts to get a little tense. And especially being immersed in a Dharma and mindful speech for 23 years, it's like, yeah, it's it's like not ethical. Yeah, it's definitely something a lot of people do, almost everybody does, and it's also hurtful. And so so much of our practice is about not causing harm. And and I've definitely caused my share of harm through gossip. And I try to watch that as, as much as I can. But 
there are definitely times when I'm just like dishing and, <laughs> you know, totally participate. But in the end, like later, I'll have a lot of regret or remorse around it. Coming up, La talks about the concept of eating ice cream while also serving the world. And they challenge the assumption that the only way to be effective is through fear and self-laceration. Right after this. You may have heard me talk about my daily smoothie game, frozen fruit, almond butter, almond milk, bananas, some Greek yogurt, etc. Lately, I've been adding a little bit of cachava super blend to the whole concoction. Cachava is a plant-based super blend made up of superfoods, greens, proteins, omegas, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and probiotics. In other words, it's got all your daily nutrients in one glass. If you're in a hurry and you don't want to make a smoothie, you can just add it to ice water or your favorite milk or milk alternative. I, though, like blending it up with my smoothie. They have five flavors. My personal favorites are vanilla and matcha. It tastes great and keeps me full for hours. Kachava is offering 10% off for a limited time. Just go to kachava.com slash happier, spelled K-A-C-H-A-V-A, and get 10% off your first order. That's K-A-C-H-A-V-A dot com slash happier. This episode of 10% Happier is brought to you by New York Times All Access. Always cool when a brand I love wants to advertise on this show. I've been an avid reader of the New York Times for at least 30 years. For the best in news analysis and culture, there's only one New York Times. And now you can enjoy Times-level expertise in the areas of games, cooking, product reviews, and sports with a New York Times All Access subscription. In addition to original reporting from journalists across the world, you can unwind with Spelling Bee, Wordle, The Crossword, and more. Enjoy delicious recipes and daily inspiration from cooking experts. Explore independent reviews for thousands of products in Wirecutter and discover in-depth, personalized sports journalism from The Athletic. New York Times All Access, everything The Times offers, all in one subscription. To subscribe, go to nytimes.com slash allaccess. Let me go back to the four questions you ask. Is my heart open or closed? Do I feel connected or disconnected? Do I feel free or am I suffering? Am I feeling empowered or disempowered? You've talked about that from a first person perspective. Those are the four questions you ask yourself when you have sufficient mindfulness to notice that you've gone into a mode of being judgmental. Can you put your teacher hat on and advise us on how we might operationalize these four questions. It's, it's quite a bit to remember. So I'm wondering how you would advise us to work with this. Yeah. So one of the first things we learn when we, when we learn to meditate is mindfulness of the body. And so it's the first foundation of mindfulness, according to the Buddhist teachings. And so it really is the more we're aware of how our bodies feel Whenever we're feeling some form of stress, whether it be something joyful or something difficult and challenging, that's the first clue. And so you can negate whether you're feeling open-hearted, connected, empowered, whether you're free, etc. So it's like, oh, can I just get, like right now, jaws clenched, my, my shoulders are up to my ears, my hands want to form fists, etc. There's like something going on. And in that moment, can we recognize that we're in pain or we're suffering? We suffer if we're adding a story about like, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this way because I should know better or whatever it happens to be. And that tends to be the counter to us having feelings is that I shouldn't be feeling this way. So to make this, the four questions just really easy is like what my teacher Eric Kolding said. It's like, just notice when you're suffering. And But, you know, also, Dan, we, we live in a culture where the baseline of our existence tends to be suffering because we're all pretty stressed out. And so the practice helps us to get like, oh, there's another way we can be. And the more you practice, the more, you know, the thoughts tend to quiet down, the more we're able to be with our emotions more fully, the more we're able to even create more ease and spaciousness in our bodies so that we can be with life as it is. 
And so when we suffer, we'll notice when we're not at that different baseline of calm and ease and spaciousness and peace. And so it becomes more acute or more present for us to, to get like, oh, I'm suffering right now. So what do, I, what do I want to do about it? So you don't need to remember all four questions, although they're great questions and can be very useful. But if you don't have access to them in your working memory at this moment, you can just notice, am I suffering right now? And it, that's a pretty useful feedback. And it may be that you're caught in a snarl of judgment for other people or yourself. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, am I feeling stressed in some sort of way and suffering in some sort of way? If I, if I just pause long enough to get like, what's going on with my body? What emotions am I feeling right now? What thoughts are going through my head? Stories are going through my head. So it's like the acronym RAIN that's been spread all over now through Tara Brock and Michelle McDonald. Of like just recognizing like what's happening, you know, can I hang out with, with this right now? And then investigating it, checking it out. How is it affecting my body? Like what emotions are arising within me? What thoughts or stories are going through my head right now? Am I suffering? Even if you just carry that phrase around with you, like, am I suffering right now? That would be enough. Because the Buddha taught two things, suffering and the alleviation of suffering. And that's what all this practice really is about, is how to be with our suffering so that we can actually live our lives fully. I, mean, I think it's quite a beautiful whittling down of the ultimate and most profound life hack. Are you suffering at any given moment? And if you are, can you stop and investigate and be cool with yourself in that moment? That is, I think, the life hack par excellence. Yeah. I'm a very simple teacher. <laughs> I don't need to, like, you know, kind of expound, expound, expound on it. Just like how my parents were with me. It's like, it's like this. My father has this really great phrase, like, think about it. <laughs> just stop and just think about, like, what's happening right now. And that's another question I ask myself throughout the day. It's like, all right, buddy, what's what's happening right now? Just randomly throughout the day. Like, what's going on? Because oftentimes we're just caught up, caught up in our Zoom meetings, caught up with work, caught up with our relationships. But to pause long enough to to get like, oh, yeah, what's what's present right now? Does anything need to be tended to in this moment? Let me ask you another question that often comes up in this context, and this this pertains to judging ourselves. I hear this a lot, and I can I can even hear it a lot in my own inner dialogue. I will achieve nothing if I don't liberally apply the internal cattle prod. How do you respond to that? Because I'm sure I'm not the first person to articulate that concern to you. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, right? Because some people need that kind of push to get motivated. And maybe that could be a skillful means. But if it gets to the point where it's harmful or painful, or we, we push ourselves way too hard, we overwork, we overcommit, we don't have time for anything or anyone or ourselves, then that's not really living. It's like, oh, what are you trying to achieve anyway? would be my question. Like, what is it that you want from this life? Fame, fortune, or just happiness, like ease? I mean, I used to push myself. I used to be a very much more of a, a striving kind of person. And a lot of that came from my doubt and insecurities and about myself and that I needed to prove that I was worthy of existence, you know? And I had to do all those things to prove that worth. And when I finally realized, like, I'm already worthy just because it's my birthright. It's just, I'm a human being. I deserve to exist and I'll do what I need to do, but I don't have to prove my worth to anyone anymore. And for somebody, you know, who has social identities like myself, that's quite liberating because so much of my life was uh, making up for the fact that I was an immigrant non-binary person of color which I often will say, like, my, all my identities are trending right now. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, once I got, like, wow, there's nowhere to get, but just be here, accept yourself, love yourself. If other people don't love or accept you, it's not about you. And so it's really about, it was really about decolonizing my heart, mind, body in so many ways from those internalized messages that I got from the culture. 
I'm going to keep pressing you, not because I disagree in any way, but just because I suspect there might be people listening who are as yet unsold. So let me invoke my dad, not an immigrant, but second generation American, Jewish, and he had a little motto, which was the price of security is insecurity. And I remember he was a uh, quite a renowned academic physician at Harvard. And I remember him once when I was starting to get into meditation, telling me that he had had some colleagues who got into meditation and it made them, and I'm quoting here, like totally ineffective. And I can hear my dad saying, okay, so you're going to rest in your inherent worthiness, but it, does that lead to total complacency? Do you then sit and eat ice cream forever? <laughs> I do eat ice cream, but then I, I still serve in the world. It's <laughs> like I can have both. So it really is a, a really, I, I totally hear where you're coming from, Dana. It's a really strong story that many of us carry in this particular capitalist, patriarchal, racist culture of like, yeah, you got to like push, you got to work hard, you got to earn, you got to, yeah. If, if that all makes you happy, then more power to you. But if it doesn't, then my invitation is to like examine what is it that you really want from your life. And for me, it's like I want a deep sense of peace so that like whatever is happening and a deep sense of equanimity so that no matter what is happening out there in the world, it's not going to knock me over. And so it really is this trust, belief in myself that I've worked, like, done that whole, like, oh, I'm going to work really hard. And it's like, yeah, I'll make more money. Or even in the Dharma world, it's like, I'll do all these different retreats and stuff. But then I just end up tired and cranky and irritable and disconnected. And I'm not happy, you know. So I've actually been switching gears. And I'm no longer teaching week-long meditation retreats. I'm more into small group mentoring and and individual mentoring because I really love being in relationship with my my students. I don't need to teach masses of people, 100, 200, 500 people at a time. That, that doesn't appeal to me. I, I care about people individually and want to support them in whatever way, whether it be collectively in a small group or individually on their own. And I feel like I'm a pretty happy, grounded, peaceful person. <laughs> because of it and and that's that's enough for me and that's another thing it was like for a long time nothing was going to ever be enough and I get to determine what that is for me at this point in my life and this is enough no matter what anyone else thinks I should be doing or how I should be doing it well as somebody who quit two lucrative anchor jobs in network television to dedicate himself to meditation I respect your professional decisions and let me see if I can kind of recapitulate at least two of the messages I'm hearing from you on this subject of judging oneself harshly as a, as a motivational tool. One, if you're carrying around the story that you need to kick your own ass in order to achieve anything, maybe investigate whether that strategy is actually making you happy. What are you getting out of it? Two, maybe investigate an assumption that might be fueling this story that you need to kick your own ass in order to get anything done. And that assumption might be that you can't be effective if you're motivated by anything other than fear and self-laceration. Yeah. There was a bumper sticker I used to have on my car that was from Ben and Jerry's that basically said, like, do what you love, love what you do. I don't know how many people can actually say that they do that. And I'm also, I'm going to acknowledge that I'm speaking from a privileged place where I don't have to worry so much about money. I've got a partner that makes good money as well. And and for some people, like whatever job they have is what they have. And I totally honor and respect that. And not everyone has that ability to make those choices. So yeah, I think it just really depends. Absolutely. We all have varying levels of luck and we're dealt different hands and much of that is out of our control. And yet I, I just do want to hone back in on this question of motivation and effectiveness, because you said earlier, I can eat the ice cream, we, ice cream keeps coming up, but I can eat the <laughs> ice cream and still serve in the world, I believe was your terminology, but you, you could rephrase that to just sort of being effective generally. I can have a sense of my own worthiness and I can be really active and uh, what I hear from that is that the 
activity can be motivated not by insufficiency, fear, lack, whatever, but it can be motivated by, I'm going to use a, a big word here. It's not a long word, but it's a big concept, love. And I don't mean that in the most string music swelling white light type of way. I mean, just sort of the basic human capacity to give a shit. You can be acting out of love for your family to provide for them, love for yourself to provide for yourself, love for your customers or clients or colleagues or listeners in my case. And so can you get out of one motivation into a more cleaner burning fuel that involves less self-judgment? Yeah, beautiful, Dan. It really is that what is underneath that drive, that striving, that push. Is it ego? Is it fame? Is it money? It's all the, the worldly wins, as they call it in the Buddhist teachings, like gain and loss, fame and disrepute, like all these different things where, you know, in our culture, that's what success has meant. And so for me, if I can help one person just breathe a little easier or love themselves just a little bit more, a day, then I, I'm good. But we don't live in a culture anymore that really takes the time to do that because it's so fast. There's so much going on. It's overwhelming to even just engage in life. So much for me around mindfulness practice is really about slowing down enough so I can actually get like how I'm choosing to engage in this life. Life is going to just do its thing, but how I relate to it is the only thing I have control and power over. Along those lines of how we're relating to whatever's happening in life, in our mind, in the world, in the universe at any given moment, in preparing for this discussion, you shared with my colleague Gabrielle some thoughts from another Dharma teacher, Philip Moffat, who asks people to ask themselves in any given moment, which mode they're in, judging, comparing, or fixing. Can you hold forth on, on that idea? So these are just like, to me, like just three different ways we just try to survive in the world. And so you know, as we were talking about earlier, just like the judgment, it's just a way of sometimes feeling superior to someone else. When, in comparing, it's like, okay, like, where am I in comparison to someone in this situation? Like, am I doing this better than they are? Are they doing it better than me? And there's always this, like, sense of competition in this comparing. And then fixing is like, I just don't want to deal with it. I'm just going to just take care of it and not mess with all this other, other stuff. And so it really is this way of, yeah, I don't like what's happening right now. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to fix it. I'm just going to make it be a certain way so that I can be okay with it. And so in many ways, it's just judging and comparing, fixing just ways that prevent us from actually just being with life as it is. How do you find yourself using this tool? And how would you recommend we do it on a moment-to-moment -moment basis? Yeah, so it goes back to that suffering. It's noticing like, oh, I'm feeling insecure or inadequate or unsure of myself. And so my habit energy is to either judge that person or compare myself to that person or want to fix myself so that I can be better at whatever is going on. And so to notice that that's happening it is to bring like compassion to the fact that like in this moment, I'm, I'm suffering right now. I'm judging myself or someone else. I'm comparing myself to someone else. I'm, I'm wanting to fix myself because I'm not enough. And so it just comes down to like, okay, noticing that that's what's happening, noticing the habit energy of any of these three qualities and pausing long enough just to have compassion for the fact that I'm just suffering right now. And can I take care of that suffering? And what I'll tend to notice is that my need for things to be different will lessen when I tend to acknowledging that that's what's happening, that the suffering is, is what's happening. That research that's been done that says the lifespan of an emotion is 90 seconds, but we carry so many of this, these emotions from childhood for decades because we never tended to it. We never acknowledged it. And so to... <laughs> Notice when judgment, comparing mind, fixing mentality occurs, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm really not wanting to be with life as it is right now. So what do I need to do to take care of myself in this moment? I noticed that a lot in my own meditation. I heard a teacher, and I can't remember who it was, maybe it was Eckhart Tolle say, and maybe many teachers have said this, but like, 
One interesting question to ask yourself is, what is standing between you and being present right now? And I see a lot in my meditation that, <laughs> what is it? Why are we uncomfortable being awake right now? Because we're constantly like living in the past and living in the future. That's how we're conditioned. We're either like trapped in memories and stories or regrets of the past. Or if that doesn't work, then like, okay, well, maybe it'll be better sometime down the road or anticipating, oh, I'm going to go on vacation or I'm going to be doing this really great activity, but I can't be here right now. And so it really is pausing long enough. And I think that that being present is so hard because we're just not taught how to be present unless we, at some point in our lives, run up against mindfulness or meditation or the Dharma and really get like the only truth that there is in this life is the present moment. The past is already gone. The future is not even here. And there's no guarantees that we'll even have a tomorrow. And so to me, that's what makes the present so much more precious and valuable is like, it's all there is. But we, we're not conditioned in that way. We're so conditioned quite the opposite. What the hell is here? <laughs> Nothing's going on right now. Well, that's good because when you thought about the future, you were getting anxious. And when you thought about the past, you were feeling regretful. So in this present moment, like I think Eckhart Tolle even said, in this present moment, there's nothing wrong. It's right now. There's like nothing wrong. Coming Up Law talks about how to celebrate rather than beat yourself up when you recognize that you've drifted off in meditation. They also talk about using our powers of discernment to separate who someone is from their behavior. That's coming up right after this. When you hear the word kombucha, you probably think that's uh, supposed to be good for me, isn't it? And it is. But did you know that most kombuchas have something like five tablespoons of added sugar? However, hum kombucha has zero sugar, low sugar, and no sugar added options, so you always know what you're getting. And it's absurdly tasty. The good folks from Hum recently sent me a case of the stuff, and I and many members of my family tried it, and it was very, very delicious. We sipped everything from strawberry lemonade to peach tea to blueberry mint. If you want to check it out, go to humkombucha.com and get 25% off a six or eight pack to try it out. That's hum with two M's, kombucha.com, and use the code HAPPIER to get a deal and sip for yourself. I was just talking to my wife about the fact that we had a quite positive experience recently with Instacart. We got a lot of household essentials, paper towels, sparkling water, yeah, I know that makes us a little bougie, but we like our sparkling water. We also got a basketball hoop for our eight-year-old son's room, which he is very excited about. With Instacart, I can easily order my groceries and other weekly essentials. Shoppers help deliver the order right to my door in as fast as an hour, giving me some time back to, I don't know, play basketball with my son. With Instacart, you have access to get items delivered from over 1,000 stores and 75,000 locations across the country. And Instacart shoppers provide support while they shop, share real-time updates, and deliver your order with care. Visit instacart.com or download the app to get free delivery on your first order. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum order, $10. Additional terms apply. This discussion is bringing to mind one of my principal arenas for self-judgment, which is meditation. And this kind of judgment that I see come up in my own mind when I'm not awake, when I, I, when I wake up from some long jag where I'm planning a homicide or whatever, and just to, to train myself over time to not get caught by that judgment, just to make a mental note of, oh, that's what's happening right now. I've woken up. And now I'm being judgmental about the fact that I woke up, but I can just, I can fall back and, and include that in my awareness too. Am I making any sense? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, totally, Dan. And that's the thing is like, we don't give enough credit to that moment where we wake up. We automatically go to the fact that we judge that we fact that we weren't awake, like you were saying. And so 
to me, it's like I invite all my students to like, when you acknowledge that you've gone, your attention has been drifting and it's been drifting for the last 45 minutes and you're aware of that, like celebrate that. Like, that's great. Over time, the more you do this, that window of time between when you go off and when you come back will get shorter and shorter. Or you'll be aware of like, oh, I've gone off. Okay, I, I recognize that. And that's great. Well, let me just come back. Let's just begin again. And so rather than judging, it's like if we can just say we can just begin again. It's like we just start all over again. It's not a problem. But there's just so much conditioning to judge when we think we've done something wrong. There's nothing wrong with drifting off. We all do it. But it's how you come back is really the practice. And that's where that compassion, that kindness, that gentleness, that often maybe we didn't get. It's like, oh, you drifted off. What's the matter with you? You suck. Or like, you're an awful person. Like, you can't ever do this. It just is painful. So we can remember, like, there's no really any place to really get. It's just to be aware of what's happening and to come back if you drifted away. I'm always telling people that moment when you wake up from distraction is often a moment for self-judgment or self-laceration, but actually it should be a moment for self-congratulation because you've woken up and you're seeing something about the mind. Whatever distraction you've noticed is teaching you or familiarizing you with your habits of mind so that they don't own you as much. Now, I say that to people all the time, and yet I fall into self-judgment when I meditate too, and then I have to kind of give myself the same talk. Increasingly, what I've noticed is when I get carried away, usually it's by one of two principal inner demons, anger or self-centeredness. And I've really trained myself to say the following when I wake up to that, thank you. Thank you to my inner rage monster or my inner self-promoter, because even though they're doing it unskillfully, they are trying to help me. And so just blow it a kiss and then go back to whatever I'm trying to focus on. Exactly. Because they're always going to be there. It's just habit energy. It's just a habit that we have. And so when we get that this habit like is hurtful or painful, I mean, why would you want to engage in a practice where you're just constantly berating yourself and judging yourself? I, like, I wouldn't even med- want to meditate anymore. <laughs> like, it's not a great motivation. But if the result of me being kinder and gentler with myself and more compassionate, it's like, oh, that actually feels good. It allows me to accept my humanity it allows me to like accept that I'm not perfect, that I do have flaws or I don't do everything really well. And can that be okay? And only I can like say that that's okay or not okay. But I've gotten to this point, Dan, where, you know, I don't necessarily like judge myself. I mean, these feelings like come up, but it's it's not like, oh, la, you're awful or like you don't know anything or any of that. But it's gotten to the point where like I feel so far away from those voices that it sometimes makes it hard for me to relate to people that still are stuck in that place. I'd love to be in your place, (laughs) judging the other people who were caught up in (laughs) self-judgment. Because it's like, oh my gosh, it's just like, it's so painful. It's like, stop doing that to yourself. Like you're just, yeah, you don't deserve that. Nobody deserves that. Amen. As we wing toward the end of our time together, I want to see if you'd be open to telling another personal story. And this one has to do with not self-judgment, but judgment of others. And in particular, your tendency to be judgmental of your own family, including your your mom. Would you be open to telling that story? Sure. Yeah. So my mom and I had a very contentious relationship for a lot of our lives. Both my parents are very controlling and sometimes manipulative, but, you know, all out of a place of really wanting the best for us and loving us, but not really knowing how to do that in a way that felt good to me. And so, like what you're talking about, that a person that drives us to strive or to motivate us by not necessarily saying the, the best things. And so... It was just really painful for me growing up to hear a lot of critical messages about how I looked, how I acted, how I lived my life, etc. And when it came down to my mom's last year of life, she had a, a terminal brain tumor. I vowed that I would 
take that time, that limited time to heal my relationship with my mother. And so much of that really was, is it possible for me to just accept her for who she is? And that at 78 years old, that she's not going to change, no matter how much I try to explain myself or or do good in the world or whatever, she's going to have her judgments or feelings about that. And what happened was that the more I focused on accepting her for who she was, it helped me just accept myself for who I am and that I didn't need that external sense of approval from her anymore to validate my existence. And so my judgments of her political beliefs or her religious beliefs or criticisms of me or my sister, it was just like, that's all her stuff. I don't have to internalize this anymore. And so that judgment transformed into acceptance of who she was and then just trust and faith that in this lifetime, like she did the best that she could with what she knew, with what she had, what she experienced, the traumas that she lived through. There's so much that I I don't know about my mom and still don't know about my mom that informed how she did show up in this life and in our lives. And so it it was really very healing ultimately for me to um, just get, she is the way she is and she was. And how I related to that was really what was going to determine my healing and my freedom in my relationship with her. And just to be clear, your acceptance of her does not equal endorsing her views that you find unacceptable. It's just accepting that this is the way she is. I can love her anyway, but I don't have to agree with her. Exactly. So for me, a big thing is being able to discern, going back to that word, between who someone is and their behavior. So if I believe that, like the Dalai Lama says, we all have innate goodness, Buddha nature, in terms of Buddhist practice, then that's inherent in every single person, even the most, who we think are the most despicable of us in this world. So that's separate and distinct from one's behavior, how one chooses to show up, or not even chooses sometimes, it's just conditioned to show up in this world. And so when I make can make that distinction, that's where I can have a sliver of compassion or a sliver of understanding for someone and not throw them out of my heart. I can set a boundary and say like, no, you're not going to do that behavior around me anymore. I still love you, but you know, you can't be in my life right now. That's where that distinction comes into play. I guess the only last question that comes into my mind, and you, 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 you made a nod in this direction earlier. But it does seem like our society would function way better at an interpersonal level, but also at a macro level, if we could move from judgment to discernment. Yeah, I think a lot of it is around the connotation that the word judgment, judgmental, judging has. People always say, like, don't judge me. (laughs) There's like that saying. And so to me, the word judgment really creates this separation between between all of us. And I feel like discernment really creates a bit more thoughtfulness, a bit more openness, a bit more willingness to engage. La Sarmiento, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you, Dan, for having me. Thanks again to La. Let me just quickly say that this episode was based on a Dharma talk that La gave at Spirit Rock a little while ago. The recording of that can be found on Dharma Seed, which is a website that compiles Dharma talks. We will put a link in the show notes. 10% Happier is produced by Gabrielle Zuckerman, DJ Kashmir, Justine Davey, and Lauren Smith. Our senior producer is Marissa Schneiderman. Kimmy Regler is our managing producer. And our executive producer is Jen Poyant. We get our scoring and mixing by Peter Bonaventure of Ultraviolet Audio. Thank you all for listening. We'll see you in a few days with something new. Hey, hey, Prime members. You can listen to 10% Happier early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen early and ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, 
do us a solid and tell us all about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. In business, competition is the key to success. Every product you own, from the shoes on your feet to the phone in your hands, got there because of cutthroat business decisions. And Wondery's podcast, Business Wars, brings you stories about the most well-known companies in the world and how the decisions they make shape what you buy and how you live. With over 50 seasons to choose from, you'll hear about the fight for your feet with Nike versus Adidas, the battle to control the smartphone market with iPhone versus BlackBerry, or the game-changing company that is Tesla and Elon Musk's bid to take on the entire auto industry. Business Wars covers every sector from fashion to food, tech to travel, sports to pop culture, and more. These stories are entertaining, fun, eye-opening, and will help you understand a little bit more about the world around you. Follow Business Wars wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. The world is full of inspiring people who've achieved unimaginable feats. Some have scaled the tallest mountains. Others have created music beloved by millions of people. Whose Amazing Life is a podcast from Wondery that celebrates these one-in-a-million stories. Each episode walks you through the life journey of a legend in their field. They could be an athlete, an artist, an explorer, an actor, anyone who made an impact on the world around us. But here's the catch. You won't know who we're describing until the very end of the episode. So it's your job to play along. From the creators of Little Stories Everywhere and Adventures of Cairo. Whose Amazing Life is a podcast for the whole family that allows you to spend some time walking in the shoes of legends. Listen to the clues and do your best to immerse yourself in the life of someone amazing. Follow Whose Amazing Life wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app.